Hello, dear friends. Welcome. One more uh, episode for you. Hello, Lou. How are we doing today? Good, good. We're at episode 162, chapter 15, one of the dense in the Gita, in my opinion. Yes. And today we're doing verse 5. Uh, Lou likes these really deep philosophical <laughs> <laughs> episodes, so that's good. Yeah. So today, verse 5, we're doing, and it says, Once a person is free from pride and delusion and has gotten rid of or conquered the evils of attachment ever rooted in the self or Brahman, his desires having completely gone, he is well liberated from the pairs of opposite like joy and sorrow, heat and cold. Then such an undiluted person reaches that eternal goal. So as you have seen in the verse, two verses prior to this, Krishna says, take the axe and cut the roots of this tree of the samsara. So he says, the world to which you are attached right now, cut it off by getting rid of your attachment. So we will talk about what is attachment. Very, very, very important. This, this verse is practical for you. So just keep listening. And the next verse after that, he says, once you have gotten rid of the attachment to different things, seek to be one with the Brahman. But it doesn't really tell you how to do that. And this verse tells you how to do that. So recognize and we talked about this last time that when consciousness or life the force the energy that comes into your body purusha that merges with this material part of your body that consciousness in and of itself when it's pure conditioned pure unconditioned consciousness is paripurna it's completely happy existing conscious but there are no desires in it once it attaches to the body and then that same energy, that same life force, that same consciousness starts to identify with the body, the mind, the intellect and the sense organs. What happens then is it develops a thought, right? We remember we have a thought, right. multiple thoughts have a desire that multiple desires causes you to take action on that. So it all starts with a thought and that thought comes from an underlying vasana. So you have to have underlying vasanas from previous lives or even this life. A vasana is a desire. And then it comes to a thought, then comes to desire, comes to attachment. So it uh, comes to action, sorry. So recognize that the stream of thoughts, once you have one thought, it's one thing, right? You look at, let's say, a piece of fruit or apple or pie lying on the table and you're diabetic and your doctor said don't eat that that sweet stuff one thought and you turn your head away just like lou likes that example of the marshmallows <laughs> yes turn your head away don't look at it you walk away that's one thought no problem you've walked away from that you say i don't want to go near it because the more i look at it the more tempted i get but if you keep looking at it stay in the same room say no i don't i shouldn't i should i shouldn't i should that stream of thoughts becomes an attachment. It's called an attachment. It binds you. That attachment binds you to that object or that situation or the person. A stream of thoughts is known. Some of these you may want to write down, friends, because it keeps coming up all the time. It's basic to you. A stream of thoughts is an attachment. Even more thoughts from that attachment, it becomes a raw, big, thick river of attachments, of thoughts and desire. That becomes a desire. Right. Then you desire it and the desire mounts and mounts and mounts and then it becomes an action. But in the process of doing so, that desire, those desires get modified. So you might have greed, you might have um, so, uh, jealousy, you might have anger. So we've talked about this previously, but just briefly for those who might be just joining us now, bear with me, the rest of you, please. So if you have a desire let's say a young man is attracted to a young woman in the office and he keeps thinking oh she likes me she's smiling at me but and she, he's saying wow i think i'm getting closer to getting her to like me all of a sudden a new guy joins the office 
and her attention now starts to turn to him. He can see that she's dropped her attention for him. His desire is unrequited or returned from her. And so now she's paying attention to the other guy. What happens? That desire for her turns to anger towards this person who has come. So desire when unfulfilled turns to anger. If you, the desire is for, let's say, money, and you get money, that becomes greed. You say, I want more, I want more, I want more, no matter how much you get. The same desire, if you get some amount of money, but somebody else has more, you're jealous. The same desire turns to jealousy. So, so on, we've talked about this. It turns to all kinds of different modifications. Those are the desire modifications. Now, recapping, you have a thought, you thought stream of thoughts becomes an attachment, more attachments, more desires turns to a desire. So more attachments turn to a desire. The desire then turns to action. Of your man. Man is, um, man is, ma in Sanskrit means, um, sorry, man means to measure. Right, ma means to measure. So map. If you go to a tailor in India and they want to measure something, he'll say map. He wants to take a ma. So ma means measure. Mm -hmm. So the word man means comes from measuring your own respect for yourself. That's what man is. So people who know Hindi, Sanskrit, Indian languages will understand what. And this particular quality Krishna describes is called nir man and moha, nirman moha. So that means no man and no moha. Man is respect. Respect, measurement of your own self-respect. So if you, how do you measure one's own self-respect? You basically say, I'm a man or a woman, right? You start to qualify yourself. That is the beginning. You say, I'm a man, I'm a woman. I'm happy. Brahman has no gender. Brahman is not a male god or Brahman, or the self, or this energy of consciousness, is an energy, a force. There's no male or female. But you say, I'm a male or I'm a female. Happy or unhappy, relating to your mind. Or you say, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, I'm a professor. You give yourself that kind of thing from your intellect. And lastly, you might say, I own three yachts, I own a big house. All of that is all part of your man, your respect for yourself. Why do we demand respect from others? Because this man, if it's too much man, you have abhiman. If it's too little respect from other people, somebody insults you, it's called an upman. Upman, all of these things are prefixes to the basic concept of man, which is my respect for myself. Upman means somebody has hurt my respect. Somebody give me too much respect. Now, this we're all guilty of this. We want people to say good things about us. We want people to respect us. We, so this is the first quality that Krishna says, if you control this, it's easier to control your attachments. And you'll see towards the end of this episode why that is so. So control your man, control your moha, control all of these things that we'll go into. So your self-respect requires for you only because you have a lesser respect for yourself, you require other people to give you respect. So your feelings about yourself, your respect for yourself is unfortunately dependent on other people saying good things about you. So right. really what that means is that your own value of yourself, your own measurement, your own ma measure of yourself is defective or deficient. Therefore, you need other people to tell you, oh, wow, what a nice house you have. Oh, wow, you look so handsome. You look so beautiful. You are so rich. You're a very strong looking man. You have so much. You are a doctor. You're a lawyer. You're a professor. You have achieved so much in your life. You should know that on your own. And so one of the qualities that Krishna says is get rid of this man. Get rid of this feeling of, I need other people to do this. Because once you do that, once you're self-sufficient in your own respect, then you don't need other people to say it. So he then tells you that by self-analysis, 
the more you require from other people, the more you say, I need to get dressed up so people say X, Y, or Z about me, analyze that to say, why? Why do I need that? I should be self-sufficient in my own respect for myself. You will find that just by recognizing this, all of these qualities can be obtained just by knowledge, which you're getting now, and introspection into your own thought process. That's all you have to do. You don't have to go to a store. You don't have to buy it. You don't have to pay money for it. You don't have to sit and meditate for this for a long time. You just have to think about it. So we demand respect from others because our own respect for ourselves is deficient. So if you can analyze your own respect for yourself and develop that self-respect to say, I am what I am, it will help. Next one is moha, M-O-H-A, moha. In Sanskrit, this means, this is very important, false values to objects, things, situations, or people. You give false values. So, for instance, you want something. You want a yacht. You say, okay, I need this yacht because I'm a very wealthy man. He's a very wealthy man. He has a yacht. That is my dream object. If I can only get a yacht as big as his, then I'd be happy. No, 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 no. I want a little bigger than his because after all, he's got a beautiful yacht. I want a bigger yacht than his, slightly bigger. Well, more recently, I have to go into space. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I'm a billionaire. I want to go into space. He's going into space. I want yeah. to go into space. Even if I just get five feet above the <laughs> level of the atmosphere, no matter how much money you have, you're always feeling insufficient. So that is false value to situations, objects, or places to go or people. Now, what happens when you give a false valuation to something? You get disappointed. Keep that in mind. Whatever objects you have this moha towards, you will get disappointed when you get it, okay? Keep that in mind. You get that yacht, you say, yeah, I got the yacht. It's even bigger than my neighbor's yacht, but I'm, you know what? Now I look at the other yacht. I got in my yacht. I went out a mile into the water and I saw, whoa, look at that yacht. It's even bigger than mine. Whatever object it is, rarely, if ever, do you say, I'm so happy with this. And if there is, by the way, you will get it. It's temporary. After a while, you start to find faults in it. Like we discussed in our last episode, Vairagya. You say, I'm not happy with this. So, so that's more false attachment to false values to things that you get disappointed. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Next one is um, Jeet Sangh Dosha. Jeet means conquered. Sangha means attachment. Dosha means expectations from the object to which you're attached. So you have to conquer the attachment to things and you have to conquer the expectations that you have from the object. So any object, here's another thing for you to write down. Any object without which you feel incomplete, that is an attachment, right? We talked before yeah. about what was an attachment. Stream of thoughts is an attachment. Any object without which you feel incomplete, that is one object to which you are attached, right? Sangha. Yeah. And when you lose that object, you feel grief. When you gain that object, you feel disappointment. Either way, you lose. Again, you have a yacht, you have it, you crave for it, you have it. When you lose it, you feel, you feel grief. But when you have it, you start to say, eh, it's not as good as I wanted. So either way, you lose. So that attachment to that object, to that situation, to that person, will cause you to be bound to it. Either way, whether you don't have it and you want it, you're bound because your desires keep pulling you towards it. And when you have it, you feel bound because you don't want to lose it. So either way, again, you lose. So this is brilliant. You know, when it came through the Upanishads to the Gita thousands and thousands of years ago, it taught us about these attachments, these bind, this bound uh, feeling. So how do you get past it? Proper thinking, proper analysis and self-control. So you got to control yourself. When you, this is another thing to write down. When you have a thought towards an object, towards a situation, towards a person, 
analyze that thought. Say, what exactly am I thinking? Why do I need it? Why am I appointing this false value to this? Why am I giving this object, situation, person false values? Oh, she's the most beautiful thing in the world. I want her. I love her. I want to get married to her. That attachment binds you to her. Proper thinking, proper analysis, self-control. Now, dosha. Dosha is expectations from the object. Now, you say, this is the most beautiful person in the world. I want to get married to her. Now you have an expectation. That expectation is she's going to look as beautiful as she does when she's out at a party as she does when she wakes up in the morning. (laughs) So so when she's not, you say, "Ah, she's not as beautiful as I thought she was. When I guess she takes off her makeup. I'm just giving you an example. You can apply it to anything you want. There are expectations, there are going to be side effects. Side effects, I'm being a physician, we recognize when you give medication, there's always side effects, always. Rarely is there a medication that doesn't have side effects. When there are expectations from an object, a person, a situation, the side effect is that that expectation is never or rarely met. So what are the side effects of this dosha? Sorrow because it doesn't meet your expectations, pain because it goes the opposite way. Don't forget, if it's a person that you're craving dosha, expectations from, that person has her or his own expectations. And so he or she may say, I don't like what he did. I'm leaving. So there's pain because he left or she left. There's grief because you lose that expectation. There's Agitation, your mind is agitated because you expect something and you're not getting it. There's hurt, there's disillusionment, all of these, and there's many, many more feelings of the mind. It is the mind that is at the bottom of all these desires. And the mind is the one that's constantly churning back and forth, being disappointed. The next one is adhyatma nitya, the shifting our attention towards ourself, towards ourself with a capital S our own Atman, shift the attention from the world. This is what we talked about in the last episode that we did. Shifting the attention towards Brahman, getting rid of the attachments that you have. Once you do that, then what? You have to make sure that you shift your attachment from a piece of pie that is on the table as we gave as earlier as an example. You don't want to say, oh, I don't want to look at that. I'm going to a different room. But in that other room, you say, well, what about this chocolate here? Yeah. Right? You've shifted your attachment from the piece of pie to a chocolate. That's not good. So make, you sure you rise, make sure you raise your attachments, right? Raise your attachments or be without attachments. Or be without them, yeah. So if you're attached, I mean, ultimate attachment is to Brahman. That is the really the goal of the Vedas. The Vedas, Upanishads, Gita, all teach us that the one goal is to be one with Brahman. That is your ultimate goal. So that is your raising your attachment, your goal, your desires, all focused one single-mindedly towards doing that. Now, not in this lifetime, but at least you'll get further in this lifetime. Next time you start way ahead, next life. So... Adhyatma Nitma means shift our attention towards the self. Commit to seeking Brahman. If you can just commit to that, it makes a huge difference. Now, committing to seeking Brahman is like saying, please commit to being in love. (laughs) You can't commit to being in love. Being in love essentially is, if you know any lovesick kind of person, he or she is just sitting there looking very wistful her eyes are up in the air looking at you know thinking about her her loved one that's all she's thinking of you don't need to tell her or him to be in love right that love is automatic it's all empowering all encompassing all controlling all it does is she just thinks he just thinks about his loved one you don't have to tell him to commit to it so this adhyatma nitya is shifting our attention to the self and being as if a, a lovesick person is thinking about brahman all the time that's his main focus that's her main focus obsessed with the comprehension of brahman and reaching that self realization and then the last one is vi nivritta kama which is one who is free from all desires 
one who is free from all desires. Now, this is also an important one. You have to have a pure, single point of thought towards the self, a desire to reach the self. All other desires are silent. Now, you may say, okay, I understand that, but not necessarily. Look at this twist over here. When a desire leaves, like I'm looking at that piece of pie over there and I'm saying, I want that piece of pie. Now nah, nah, I'm going to look somewhere else. That desire hasn't truly left me because a part of my mind is always thinking, yeah, you know, I left that piece of pie <laughs> over there. I could have gone back. I should have had it. Or the man who says, you know, that girl, I'm not thinking about her. I'm thinking about, but his mind is still saying, I gave that up. Part of him feels almost like he made a sacrifice yeah. and he feels that he needs to be compensated for that. He needs to make himself whole by seeking something else. You all have experienced that. That is the part that needs to go. The V, V nivritta kama, the V represents or refers to the feeling that there is nothing left over. So, you know, when I was a child and I was in India, even when I came to this country, USA, many, many, many years ago, everybody was smoking. And that smell, I never smoked, but the smell of that cigarette smoke, no matter what you did, never left. Some of my friends used to smoke and they say, my family is going to get mad if they know I smoke. I got to mm -hmm. use something. You take yeah. some gum. You have some gum, <laughs> put it in their mouth. And as soon as he got home, the mother would say, have you been smoking? Yep. You know, why? Because no matter whether you give it up or not, your body, your fingers, your mouth, everything is smelling of that cigarette smoke. It's like eating garlic or onion. You brush your teeth, you get rid of anything, your mouth, your fingers, your hands, whatever you ate it with, your, your clothes, your body, smells of that garlic or, or onion. You cannot get rid of it. Similarly, a desire when you just basically control it, in and of itself is not going to get rid of the underlying feeling that I'm deprived. So here he's saying one who is free from all desires means that not only is he free from the desires, but even any aftermath, any leftovers of that desire are also gone. There's a pure single point of thought towards the self. All other desires are silent. So we often feel that their happiness, our happiness, lies somewhere else, in another place. Yeah. If I go on vacation, if I go to the Caribbean, I'll be happy. If I'm at another time, I'll be happy. Another object, another person, another event will make me happy. When you actually say, oh, no, you know what? I have a lucky opportunity to settle down in the Caribbean. I just hit the lottery and I'm going to retire and I'm going to move to the Caribbean. It's just a matter of time before you say, I'm not really happy here. I wish I was back in the United States. The right. beach, the ocean, all of that is good, but it's too hot here. The Wi-Fi isn't as good. The telephone service isn't good. Ah, the way roads are too crowded. Whatever it is, you're not going to be happy. So happiness is not somewhere else. Happiness is within you. Recognize that. Think about it. When your mind says, let's go on vacation. Let's go somewhere else. Let's do this. Let's do that. Recognize that it's futile. It's temporary happiness. That's it. So the last thing is dwanduas. In this verse, he talks about, if you, if you remember right in the beginning, he says heat, cold, uh, joy, sorrow. These are all dwanduas. And a person who has conquered his dwanduas is the one who can ultimately reach his goal. Don't forget, all of these that I mentioned today that Krishna gave us, man, moha, Sangha, Dosha, um, Aditya, Adhyatma, Nitya, and Vi, Nivritta, Kamaha. All of these are Krishna's way of telling us, if you work on these, it becomes easier to detach with you, that axe of detachment. You cut the roots, and then you can become one with Brahman. So Dwandwas, Krishna says, are two opposite sides of a coin, heat and cold, joy and sorrow, and what prevents us from meditating or having a single point of mind is the fact that we like one thing of that coin and we dislike the other. And what Krishna says is, like both sides of that coin equally. If you say, 
Otherwise, your minds are going to run to it. When you're meditating, your mind, your thoughts are going to run towards what you like, and they're going to run away from or right. dislike the other. So you say, oh, it's too hot. I'm meditating, but it's too hot. I can't concentrate. You know, you've got to try and just recognize that you've got to get past those feelings or desires on your part to just be just be one and not the other. That's why Ganesh, you know, he has two tusks and one is broken. It's symbolic. The symbol symbolism is that even Ganesh, both things are not equal. He is able to live with the fact that there is inequality, that he can like both. So this is verse five. It hopefully... Lou, even though it wasn't as deep a philosophy as you like. No, but we've been talking about attachment for so long, and there were some good new elements in here and some new ways to deal with it, new ways to look at it, and it's such an important principle. It, it was nice to get a fresh lo look at it. Yeah, and I think this was a little practical more than just deep philosophy. Yeah. So, yeah. friends, I hope you like uh, what you hear. If you do, please send me questions, comments, criticisms, whatever you want. You can email me at Gita Memoirs, M-E-M-O-I-R-S, of a psychiatrist at gmail.com or write to me on Facebook through Messenger or however you want to do it. Right, Lou? And That's did I right. miss out anything? No, nope. Facebook is a great way to communicate with us. Gita's, uh, Gita Memoirs of a Psychiatrist at Gmail is a great way if you're not on our Facebook page, which is Gita Memoirs of a Psychiatrist. Look for us on Facebook, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify. We were talking before we recorded this show, our best week ever on the show, for some 160 episodes in. People are following along and having a great time. We love having you all. Bring some friends, and we'd love to talk this all over. Yeah. Thank you, Lou. Thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next time.